Frank Herbert's 1965 novel Dune has often been called one of, if not the best, science fiction book of all time. It's also been cited as a source of great inspiration for Star Wars. I've heard that for years, but had never read the book, so couldn't really comment on it. With the new film adaptation coming out, I figured now was the perfect time to finally read the science fiction classic and see what all the fuss is about. In the basic setup of the galaxy, we have an Imperium ruled by an Emperor who is mostly absent for the story, popping up only at the end of the book. He has a fighting force called the Sardaukar, elite soldiers feared across the galaxy. It's not hard to connect the lines from the Imperium to the Empire, the Emperor Shaddam IV to Emperor Palpatine, and the Sardaukar to the Stormtroopers, although the Sardaukar actually seemed to be more capable. Obviously, the big similarity is the presence of a desert planet. Luke Skywalker lives on Tatooine, Paul Atreides lives on Arrakis. That spirals out into a handful of other similarities. Tatooine moisture farmers collect water using moisture evaporators. Arrakis locals, called Fremen, use dew collectors. I would also argue that the Fremen share some similarities with Tusken Raiders, a local culture misunderstood by the outsiders who survive on what the desert provides, living in specialized clothing, making raids on their colonial enemies. We learn over the course of the book that the Fremen are highly specialized warriors and far more numerous than first thought. Their ability to fight against and defeat the Sardaukar is kind of like the Ewoks defeating the stormtroopers on Endor. The desert plains of Arrakis are perilous thanks to the massive sandworms. I've seen them compared to the Sarlacc a handful of times and for good reason, but now that we've seen a crate dragon in action, I think that's a much better comparison. Crate dragons basically swim through the desert just like the sandworms. The Fremen even use riding the worms as part of a rite of passage for their people. The hunt for a crate dragon and retrieval of its pearl was a rite of passage for Tusken Raiders as well. The Fremen have special weapons called Chris Knives that were created from the teeth of dead sandworms, which is kind of reminiscent of the highly valued pearls. Arrakis is the only planet in the galaxy known for producing melange, or spice. That substance prolonged life and opened up the mind of its users, allowing visions of the future, interstellar travel, and more. It's considered to be the most valuable resource in the galaxy. The Spacing Guild has a monopoly on space travel, but smugglers would often bring spice off-world. A New Hope and several other Star Wars stories have brought up spice as well. C-3PO fears being sent to the spice mines of Kessel early on in the film. Spice is similar in Star Wars in that it's a drug, but that's pretty much where it stops. It can also be used medicinally, and while valuable, it's far from the most valuable resource in the galaxy. It was also found on many planets instead of just one. Smugglers like Han Solo often shipped spice for criminal syndicates. The Spacing Guild has navigators that use spice to see ever so slightly into the future so they can avoid objects in space while traveling at light speed. That's basically the exact concept as the Chiss Skywalkers of Star Wars, young Chiss girls that use the Force to successfully navigate the chaos of the unknown regions through hyperspace. Moving away from Arrakis, we've got to talk about the Bene Gesserit Order. They were a group of women who were basically trying to use genetics and political machinations to force the creation of their version of the Chosen One. They were each trained to have maximum physical and mental control over their bodies, which allowed them several powers very similar to the Jedi. They had something called the Voice, which let them control people through speaking, much like a Jedi mind trick. They could see the future, sense the truth, render poisons harmless, go into meditative trances, and and they were very capable warriors. Many of their powers and abilities can be matched with analogs in the Force. Some of the terminology even has similar roots, like Bindu being a word referring to control of muscles. Lucas was originally going to call the Jedi Order the Jedi Bindu, and the name has since been given to a mystical creature in the Force. The Bene Gesserit weren't allowed to know their heritage, lest that knowledge affect their actions. Paul eventually learns that his grandfather, and therefore his Bene Gesserit mother's father, is Baron Harkonnen, their sworn enemy. While it's not treated as a massive twist, it's hard not to immediately look over at the Empire Strikes Back and Vader's revelation to Luke. Instead of Jedi Masters, the Bene Gesserit have Reverend Mothers. When a new Reverend Mother is created, they basically take on the lives and memories of every Reverend Mother that came before. So, in a way, even when a Reverend Mother dies, they live on. It's kind of like becoming one with the Force, or like when Luke reminds Rey that a thousand generations of Jedi live within her. I really like that Bene Gesserit philosophies also line up with the Jedi. One of the most famous lines in the book is, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear, I will permit it to pass over me and through me, and when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. 
Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. That is so similar to Jedi philosophy. Yoda talks about fear being the root of the dark side, leading to anger, hate, and suffering, and many Jedi beliefs are along the lines of letting emotions pass over and through them. It's not about never being afraid or never having attachments, it's about not letting those things take over your life to the point that they control you. Next, I want to talk about Paul Atreides. Again, he's the hero of the story if you've never read it. He is said to have an instinct for rightness, and Star Wars teaches us to follow our instincts because deep down we all know what's right. Paul and his father both impact an Imperial agent named Liet Kynes who was meant to work against them. Instead, he helps Paul and his family because of his conscience rather than follow his selfishness. Classic light side versus dark side. Paul goes through several trials in the book, including a fight to the death. Despite the killing being necessary and basically self-defense, he learns that, quote, when you kill, you pay for it. It's a very Jedi mindset to never revel in the death or pain of another, even an enemy. By the end of the book, Paul has become a legend in the eyes of the Fremen, who took him in and began to follow his leadership. Paul needs the Fremen to achieve his goals and seek justice for his family, but he also fears becoming a legend. That immediately made me think of Luke and his own struggles with becoming the legendary Luke Skywalker and what it meant for not just the galaxy, but his family. If Paul and the rest of the Atreides represent the side of light in Dune, then the Harkonnens represent the dark. I'm being overly simplistic here, but just bear with me. Paul has a quote that reads, Didn't you learn that Atreides' loyalty is bought with love while the Harkonnen coin is hate? Harkonnen leadership is very similar to that of Palpatine in the Empire in Star Wars. The evil Baron Harkonnen says, One must always keep the tools of statecraft sharp and ready, power and fear sharp and ready. Ruling through power and fear alone? That's the kind of imperial thinking that leads to a Death Star, a weapon that exists only to make people afraid to stand up for themselves. And that's pretty much everything I noticed while reading the book. A lot of these things I'm looking into a little more than I should. I certainly don't think every little thing I mentioned was a direct result of Dune. A lot of these similarities are probably just because Lucas and Herbert were pulling from the same archetypes. But certainly the inclusion of Spice in a throwaway line, some of the earliest abilities displayed by the Jedi, and yes, Tatooine, were lifted from Dune. I also want to make it clear I'm not saying these inspirations are a bad thing at all. They don't change my enjoyment of Star Wars. Every artist has been inspired by those that came before. And most of the similarities I see people throwing around between Dune and Star Wars are very surface level. Like, look, sand, they're the same. I definitely think Lucas latched onto that idea of Arrakis for Star Wars, but in the context of the story, Tatooine represents something completely different for Luke. Tatooine is the small, backwater town Luke wants to escape so he can experience the adventure that is life. In Dune, Arrakis is the adventure. Paul grows up where Luke wants to be, and then goes to Arrakis to grow into the man he's meant to become. Both Dune and Star Wars tackle a human story that's been told over and over again. Whether you grew up in the desert or in a paradise, you need change in order to grow. And to quote the 1984 David Lynch movie, without change, something sleeps inside us and seldom awakens. The sleeper must awaken. The movie was kind of rough, but I did like that line. But that brings today's video to an end. I'm excited to see the new adaptation and maybe discuss it further. Let me know what other inspirations from Dune I missed in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.